Hello and welcome to Module 5 of the Big Elimination Tribute Project for the Building Provider Capacity for HCV Prevention Program Integration. Module 5 will focus on treatment of hepatitis C. My name is Jill Wolf. I am the Hepatitis C Program Director with the Caring Ambassadors Program. This training series has been developed in co-creation with the Chicago Recovery Alliance, and it has been adapted from a training that we did in October of 2019 and has been modified for a self-paced online module-based training. We are grateful to our sponsors for their support of this training. As the name of the project indicates, this is in honor of Dan Big, former executive director of the Chicago Recovery Alliance, a fierce hepatitis C elimination advocate. He was known as the godfather of naloxone and of course, an extremely well-known harm reductionist. We miss Dan and it is with his spirit that this training has been developed. The overall project goal is to build your capacity, confidence and knowledge to integrate responsive hepatitis C screening, testing, linkage to care, cure, and support programs into your existing infrastructures. This training is, div is divided up into seven different modules. We will be focusing today on module five, treatment. The purpose of this module is to explain the hepatitis C treatment process and clarify hepatitis C treatment goals. This module has been done in collaboration with Dr. Andrew Aronson, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago. Dr. Aronson is an ECHO trained provider here in Chicago. He is a hepatologist and a GI gastroenterologist. When this session is over, you should be able to identify opportunities for program refinement to include services that support a patient's key milestones during treatment. You'll be able to list key community resources to support patients on hep C treatment, and you'll be able to support patients towards meeting their hepatitis C treatment goals. As with all of our modules, we start each one with the spirit of nothing about us without us and hear from our storytellers on some of their so pieces. With the methadone, I'm able to function. I take care of my grandson, so he makes me run around a lot and I have to be alert on everything. So it helps me not to crave for the, for the heroin so much, but I have my minutes of uh, wanting it, mm -hmm. I want to say. And uh, uh, especially when I have it, too much money in my pockets. Hmm. So we've talked about um, MAT in a previous module and certainly important for uh, Juanita's experience on uh, what her methadone program offers her. A little bit of compassion goes a long way. I'm way, way further than you could ever imagine. And I work with a great doctor that's a colleague of mine and the interactions that she has with my clients. I mean, they tell me that they've never been talked to like that by a doctor before. And as such, they're much more honest with her about what's going on and she's better able to help them. That's a key piece of, um, as we've talked about with harm reduction, meeting a uh, client or a patient where they're at um, and facilitating a space of open honesty to uh, build relationship and rapport. And let's go ahead and hear from. Uh, what I realized was that that, that was early on in the um, when we were having effective treatments. There was a lot of bias and a lot of preconceived ideas about what people who were using drugs would do. You know, they're using drugs, so they their lives are so chaotic that they'll never be able to take these medications, which were complicated at the time. It might be taking medications three times a day as opposed to what we have now one time a day um, but you know for me i had my mind made up i was ready to go and so 
And the reality is that addicts are people who are very accustomed to taking their medications at a certain time and being adherent. And that's a huge piece that Peter touches on is some of the misconceptions around people who use drugs and their ability to be adherent, especially as it relates to hepatitis C um, medications. So we're going to go ahead and start with Dr. Aronson, who's going to do an echo style session here, and, and he'll take us through the next um, handful of slides or so. Disease. Um so when you're treating a patient and when we do our echo sessions and talk to primary care providers, you know, there's really three or four things that you need to know about a patient uh, before you get started. Um, so first is cirrhosis versus non-cirrhosis. So, uh, you know, a little while back we talked about staging. That's what the staging is all about. You need to know whether the patient has cirrhosis or not. The second thing you need to know is whether they've been treated before. So what is their treatment history? Um, have they been treated with interferon in the past? Have they been treated with a DAA in the past? Are they treatment naive, meaning they haven't had any therapy before? Um, the third thing is the genotype. And the fourth thing is to know if there's any other co-infections laying around. So does this patient also have hepatitis B uh, or does the patient have HIV? Because those are important when you're uh, managing their therapy. Certainly not reasons that you can't treat somebody, uh, but, but something you wanna know ahead of time. Um, so some of the goal treatment consideration, uh, what are the goals of therapy? Uh, how is it different if the patient has cirrhosis or doesn't have cirrhosis? What are some of the options uh, of treatment? I will talk about duration of treatment, uh, drug, drug interactions, and then we'll uh, end up with patient education. So um, the goals of treatment are a few. I mean, uh, the biggest thing is, is obviously uh, curing somebody, um, and that happens quite often, and we're going to talk about that with a little bit more detail. Um, and I think that, you know, the treatment over the years has gotten really, really simple. So um, it's kind of a, an, an annoying refrain, I think, that I always say, but I mean, if you have a patient that you're managing with diabetes on insulin, that's about a million times harder than treating someone's hep C. And you'll see that these are drugs that are very easy for us to prescribe because uh, the algorithms for treatment are actually pretty simple, um, and um, uh, those algorithms are actually very, very simple, and they can, um, uh, uh, we can find this information very easily. Um, and the most important thing is really thinking, making sure that patients have um, adherence to care. So that's the one thing that you really want to go ahead and talk about with your patients, because, um, you know, we have a lot of patients that have very complicated psychosocial issues, um, so are these patients that might have emergencies? Are they someone that has court hearings or they can have hospitalizations? The goal is really 100% adherence. The only way that this can really get messed up is if a patient does not take their medications on a regular basis. And we'll talk about this more uh, over the next couple of minutes, but the, the real key here is finding a good time for that patient where they're going to be um, uh, able to uh, maintain a hopefully close to 100% adherence. Okay, so when you're thinking about treatment of a cirrhotic patient versus uh, a non-cirrhotic patient, um, if there is an urgency, um, your urgency is to treat patients who are the farthest along. So the patients who have cirrhosis, these are the ones where I really think are kind of closest to the fire. So, you know, we all have different capacities where we work. So if you have 10 patients that you want to treat and two of them are, you've done a staging and they have stage three or stage four disease or they have uh, you think they have cirrhosis, these are the ones you're going to want to treat first. You want to treat everybody, but you want to treat the ones that have the farthest along disease because these are the folks that are going to be at risk uh, for liver cancer or for um, developing decompensation of their liver disease. The ones that are earlier, if you treat them, that's great too because you're going to prevent them from having any of those uh, health-related outcomes, adverse health-related outcomes from their uh, liver disease. Now, um, we're going to really talk about cirrhosis just as well compensated cirrhosis, but if somebody is decompensated, meaning they have ascites, they have variceal bleeding, they have hepatic encephalopathy, jaundice, synthetic dysfunction, if they look really sick from their cirrhosis and they're decompensated, these are folks that really should be seen at a transplant center. These are not usually patients who tend to be managed um, in a primary care setting. If they are managed in a primary care setting, this is usually with the help um, of a specialist helping out. So this is the drugs. I mean, these, are, these have gotten pretty easy over time. 
Um, you know, a couple of years ago, there was tons and tons of drugs out there, but now the list has actually been kind of shortened to um, a pretty manageable uh, list of drugs. So uh, the important things that I wanted to kind of convey here are there's three classes of DAAs that we use in different combinations. For those of you that are familiar with HIV therapy, kind of a lot of these names sort of sound the same. So protease inhibitors, um, NS5A inhibitors, and polymerase inhibitors. Um, and the important thing here without getting too in the weeds as far as how these all work is just know that they all work on different mechanisms of action within the viral life cycle. So they all kind of do different things to the virus. And just like in HIV, if you combine two different things or three different things that work in different ways, um, they have a much, much higher rate of efficacy because you're kind of hitting it from different angles. And then the other thing that's great is that the more uh, different uh, classes you add, the harder it is for the virus to become resistant. Um, so uh, using these different classes together uh, protects the patient uh, from developing a resistant organism. And you can see here, most of these are combinations of at least two, Sofosphavir Velpatosphir, Sofosphavir Lodiposphir. This is Sofosphavir Velpatosphir and Voxelaprevir. So this is what we use. This is a three drug combination used for patients if they ever happen to fail a DAA resident, re regimen. And then Glucaprevir and Preventosphere is another uh, regimen that's commonly used. So, um, you know, without really going too into them, just know that these are the really five different um, uh, drugs. These are all fixed dose. These are combination pills. Uh, so really, really easy for patients to take uh, and, um, and easy for us to uh, administer. So um, I know that we're going to pause for a moment and, um, and look at treatment guidelines. Um, and really, you know, you can, you can read about 100 papers and you could go and you can, you know, look at all these different uh, sets of data, or you can just come to one spot. And if you go to this, uh, the hcvguidelines.org, this really goes into all the detail that you need in order to treat somebody. And I know we're going to pause for a second to kind of navigate through this. And once you get familiar with how to use this website and how to work up your patient and all the information you need from the patient, it all gets really easy. So I would encourage anyone that's really interested in learning how to treat is to kind of click through this website because this is a non-industry sponsored. It's sponsored by the ASLD and the IDSA, two of our uh, the Liver Society and the Infectious Disease Society. And these are really, really great resources that will, um, uh, this is a great resource that will tell you all the different uh, ways to treat and the therapies that are available for each patient. Um, so uh, the take home points from my standpoint um, that the treatments that we have now have almost 100% efficacy. Uh, so almost every patient we're gonna treat is going to be cured. There's no special populations of people that we're unable to treat anymore. We can treat and cure everybody. Almost all treatments are now either eight to 12 weeks. Um, treatments are very, very uh, well tolerated and safe. There's almost no side effects. Uh, and uh, not only are patients being treated in uh, specialty uh, centers, but also uh, very, very easily cured in primary care settings as well. So thank you, Dr. Aronson. And, and he got a package delivered as you could all hear his doorbell. Um, you know, he mentioned us stopping and going through um, the HCV guidelines website, which we're not going to do, but I'm going to encourage you to check it out and you will see um, over the top here, uh, you'll be able to hover over those who have not been treated or who have been treated and be able to pick um, your patient based on uh, genotype um, with, with a series of other pieces of information you might have, and it will spit out um, the recommended treatment option. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, another important thing to consider, um, and this information has been given to us by Dr. Sarah Stoles, who is a specialty pharmacist at Juul. Um, a really great website is the University of Liverpool and they have a HEP drug and an HIV drug as well um, interaction. And so I highly encourage you to um, go in there. It will look like this and you'll be able to see, um, you'll check which hepatitis C drugs that person might be on and any other drugs that they might be on as well. And you'll be able to check for any potential drug drug interactions, which oftentimes um, as we talked about in module four, um, will be a key piece for the prior authorization to know. Um, and oftentimes it's just easiest to print off the interactions from this web page and include it as part of your package for your prior auth information. 
Now we're not gonna go through in detail um, all of these slides here, um, but I do think it's important for you to know uh, if you have your slides printed out, this is Epclusa, um, and there are some common drug-drug um, interactions that I've seen patients use um, and be unaware of how to use them in conjunction with their hep C medication, um, and it actually caused their hep C medications not to work. Um, and some of these are less common than others, but what I do want to point out that are things that uh, highly encouraging you to speak with a pharmacist on how to um, antacids are um, extremely common, the same with PPIs. Uh, we see St. John's wort, which is given over the counter, and certainly some of these statins that are elements that will need to be adjusted, um, either their dose or how and when you take those medications. Um, and so this is a vital piece to pay attention to. And this one is Eclusa. Here we've got Harvoni. Um, is the drug name again, antacids, PPIs, St. John Horts, and any statins um, will um, require um, discussion with your pharmacist to be sure that um, you don't interfere with the hepatitis C medications um, efficacy. Here we've got Zepatir, um, and I just want to point out here, like this one would be St. John's Wort, and finally we've got Maverit, um, again, uh, this one uh, would be St. John's Wort that I would want to point out as typical um, ones that we see from folks. Uh, and finally, I do want to put on here the HIV drug interactions, which you will also be able to see on that Liverpool site. Um, but here are the drug names and any type of interactions that, that exist. Um, many of the hep C regimens uh, will not require adjustments in HIV therapy and, and any switches um, uh, in medications for HIV should certainly be done with that collaborating HIV provider. Um, there are many HIV providers who will treat hep C, uh, but there are also other places um, that won't. And so be sure to speak with any um, HIV specialist for any uh, treatment changes. So in terms of treatment, um, and this is something that you'll also be working on within the staging process, but it, this is vital to educate your patient on what the purpose and the treatment goals are. As Dr. Aronson mentioned, um, our goal is 100% adherence. Um, what's true is that if you take these medications, even if you were to continue using drugs, um, illicit drugs, these medications would still work if you take them. Um, and as Peter talked about at the top of our module, you know, I know that oftentimes the, um, a reason that is given for someone not to receive hep C treatment is the fact that they are using um, substances. Um, and oftentimes, um, you know, just as Peter pointed out, people who use substances can oftentimes be the most adherent to taking medications. Um, and so that's a misconception we certainly need to talk about, but definitely encouraging uh, the patients that take 100% adherence on how they should take their medications, especially if they take antacids or Tums or anything of this nature. Want to sure, be sure to discuss those drug-drug interactions and when you do tee up this patient for starting treatment, any and every type of uh, medication that they take, even if it's over-the-counter or herbal, should be discussed. Um, and be sure to explain the refill process. You know, one thing that Dr. Aronson pointed out when we talk about a patient, we wanna really minimize any treatment disruptions. And so we wanna be sure that uh, maybe um, they're not changing insurance. Um, of course, if they know that they're gonna have a court hearing or something like this, um, it's important to um, consider that in the timing of when you start treatment. And this is also vital with the refill process of it. So making sure that this patient doesn't um, switch their insurance during treatment, um, and that the refill process, depending on if this patient is cirrhotic or not, they will only need to get one or two refills. So taking two to three months of a medication. So these are important points to talk about with your uh, clients before they start. And as we've talked about with every module, what has changed? Um, we've talked about these pan-genotypic regimens. And so uh, there used to be medications that were on that table that Dr. Aronson discussed that could only treat very specific genotypes. That is no longer the case. 
uh, so we call it pan-genotypic, that it will treat any and every uh, uh, genotype. Uh, we do have a shorter duration of treatment, and generally we're seeing anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks with few to no side effects. Um, the only side effects I have heard from folks, um, some folks do complain of um, stomach aches um, and maybe fatigue, um, and these are things that oftentimes the fatigue especially is associated with um, hepatitis C infection. Um, and so more typical what we see from a patient who's taking medications is their energy level actually increases. Um, and so there really are very few side effects that we've seen um, with the patients that we've worked with. So there's a number of treatment tools I want to point you towards. Uh, the Hep C guidelines is um, that uh, website that we pointed out in Dr. Aronson's slides. I highly encourage you to become familiar with this. Um, it's certainly um, easy to pull this piece down and include as part of your prior authorization package. Um, and as Dr. Aronson mentioned, the AASLD and IDSA are the associations that actually put that together. So um, as unbiased as you can get with that. I want to encourage you to check out at Caring Ambassadors, uh, we have what's called Discussion Point. Uh, this is a really great tool to work with your patients who have not been treated yet. Um, this is um, a question-based um, survey where the patient would answer these questions to the best of their abilities, and it's based on their treatment history and experience and what they may know about their current situation. And once the questions are over, uh, they will spit out these discussion points that uh, this patient should be sure to review it on their own. Um, and to discuss with their physicians. And so this was done with our medical advisory team. Highly encourage you to look at um, this and uh, refer your patients to this to increase their health literacy about hepatitis C. As I've discussed in other modules, I encourage you to look at the SAMHSA tip manuals. Uh, there are tip manuals, uh, treatment improvement protocols for treatment and for people who are in um, hepatitis C treatment for those who are in addiction treatment. Uh, various tips uh, that they provide there. And finally, that University of Washington, um, which is a really great website um, for calculators and other types of self-paced education as well. So uh, we have come to the end of our treatment module and we will start with cure following this. And the purpose of the cure module will be to explain the hepatitis C process. Uh, actually, it's around um, Sorry, I didn't update that. The purpose of this is to inform you of the true definition of hep C cure and vital programmatic steps to maximizing opportunities for cure. Um, be sure to take your pre and post test surveys. Uh, so if you need to get any certificates, uh, those surveys will help you do that. And as always, please don't forget to access our resources at uh, hepcchallenge.org backslash big and feel free to email us at biginfo at caringambassadors.org for any questions. Thank you, and we will see you in Module 6, Cure.